Welcome to another episode of The Financially Free Investor, where you will learn information and strategies on how to become financially independent by investing in real estate, something that is not taught openly in our society today. Financial freedom matters so you can live a bigger life, retire early, and do what matters most to you. Get ready to hear tried and true methods to becoming financially free with your host, Jordy Clark. Welcome to this episode of the podcast. I am super excited to have a really good buddy of mine, Matt Strong. He's based here in Utah. He does hard money loans. He owns rental properties. Man, you do just about a bit of everything, right? Well, yeah, a little bit of everything. I mean, one way or another, though, it's all around mostly residential, but but definitely some commercial real estate. And I'm either on one side of the table or the other. So, I mean, really quick, just to expand on that. I, you know, I bought my first flip in 2004. I'm still flipping and rehabbing. I've done a little over 400 properties, but about 10 years ago, I got into the hard money lending side of it. So, you know, I'm on that side of the table helping, you know, flippers and rehabbers fund their deals. And then I'm also very active in buying and holding commercial land, residential real estate. And then I have a small little brokerage, which uh, kind of helps me navigate all of this, my, you know, to do all these deals. So flipping, hard money, long-term holds and brokerage. That's it in a nutshell. Awesome. Thank you for that. And, and you kind of started alluding to it, but maybe give us a little bit of background on on who you are and, you know, you kind of already touched on the, the business stuff and then we'll get into the three questions I ask every guest. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So hopefully these aren't the answers to some of your three questions, but um, I mean, I'm born and raised here in Salt Lake, become very familiar with the Salt Lake Valley and seen it grow over the years. I'll, I'll be 46 next, next week, 46 years of living here. And like I said, last 16, 17 years, pretty much in real estate. Married, got three great kids, uh, live in kind of Cottonwood Heights. I haven't really even dabbled too much out of real estate over the last 15, 16 years. It's really been all in real estate one way or another. There were stretches where I did more residential, like retail sales. But for the most part, I have been my own client one way or another on my investment deals. Obviously, I haven't done them all myself. I've had partners over the years. You know, other than the hard money, I'm not my own client there, but I am basically, you know, my own bank with my network of private investors and high net worth individuals that help me fund those deals. And there's definitely a need for that. And we can get into that a little bit later. But let's jump into the three questions. So the first one is, how did you get started on your journey to financial freedom or financial independence? Well, that's, that's a really good question. And so I go back and actually, this is how my brain just operated from day one and still is to this day. And the example is this. So I didn't really know I wanted to get into real estate, but I knew I wanted to buy a house <laughs> back when we were first looking for our first home. This was back in, oh, I think it was back in 2000, 1999, 2000. And I was working at a health insurance company, a small boutique place where we did self-insured health plans. And I bring that up because it may come back a little later because the boss that I worked for then, and that was now about 23, 24 years ago, he is still one of my most valuable in all walks of life that I could determine it, you know, mentor, really good friend. And he has helped me fund hundreds of deals. And so that relationship started when I worked for him. So, you know, one quick little side note is keep good relationships with all those awesome people in your life. Don't burn bridges. You never know when you can do deals back and forth and add value to each other's lives, both financially and just in general. And so I was working for him and then went looking at new homes. And it's ironic now that I have flipped so many distressed, awful homes, because back then I was like, I, I don't want anything that needs work. I'm just going to go find a brand new house. And so we found a house in Rose Park uh, that was an ivory home. And when I went in there, I don't know anything about real estate. I don't even know how to negotiate. I don't feel like I still know how to negotiate now. But I went in there. I said, well, I don't have an agent. I think you guys normally do a commission to an agent. So can I just get 3% less off the house? And uh, they said, no, we won't do that. But if you are an agent, then you can represent yourself and we'll pay you a commission. And I said, oh, cool. Well, I'm an agent. Immediately after that, I went and started getting my real estate license. So I wasn't an agent when I signed up and put the offer on the house, but I became an, an agent before I closed. And so I bring this up because back then, FHA loans, rates were at 8%. 
And Ivory was offering, you know, they'll pay your closing costs if you go through their preferred lender, blah, blah, blah. And so my path to no money out of pocket on my first house was set. I think I ended up putting $500 into the deal because I credited my commission to the down payment. I've repaid my closing costs. I did an FHA, three and a half percent down loan, 8% interest. My payment was $13.22 a month on a $154,000 purchase Rambler in Rose Park. So from day one, I'm like, oh, this is how you do it. You just, no money out of pocket, you can buy real estate, right? And so that was my start of real estate. So what happened then is I'm like, well, this is interesting. Maybe I want to start selling real estate. So I actually got a job with Ivory for four years and sold residential like real estate out of a model home. And for me, that didn't end up being like real estate. That was just like, I was selling real expensive pants. You know, I didn't have to really think through or strategize on the real estate. So, but then as I got into flipping, it's like, okay, flipping generates cash, cash generates down payments, down payments then go to buying and holding long-term real estate. And we can talk about, you know, touch on, we're not going to have a ton of time, but the Burr method or otherwise, but unless you're burring, you basically have to have a pile of cash, put it as a down payment. And so I bought my first rental property, which I still own today out in Rose Park. I've since refinanced it a few times. Otherwise, it'd probably be paid for. So that's really how I got started. I got started by being curious about owning, no money out of pocket, working as an agent, and then starting to flip. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, we could get into so many different uh, strategies. And the next question is, is, what is the one thing you would want to tell someone who's currently working towards financial freedom? Well, there's a couple of things. Maybe it's just not one thing, but I I would say the biggest thing is get comfortable, know how to manage and assess the risk of leveraging your properties. Meaning if you want to become financially free in real estate, you cannot do it paying cash (laughs) unless you have such a high paying job and then you don't need to be financially free because you just got a ton of cash coming in. So At some point, we need to get comfortable with responsible use of leverage, meaning understand loan programs, understand what it takes to finance real estate, understand how that interacts with potential rents, operating expenses, all that kind of stuff. I mean, all of that stuff comes later, I think. But I think if you're asking for one thing that someone's first starting out, needs to focus and understand is the different financing options that are available because with proper leverage, man, that's how you can create massive wealth. Now you could also create massive problems and bankruptcy foreclosure, short sales too, if you don't know what you're doing. But I mean, I think there's many things, but I think if there's one thing is know what loan programs work and then that'll help guide you as far as how do you responsibly have a credit score? How do you file your taxes? All that other stuff. And then What properties can you afford? How do you structure the deal? But understanding debt financing, especially in the residential commercial real estate world, that will be huge. Or and or seller finance. You know, you don't even need to get a loan if you know how to do a seller finance or get the seller to carry a note, all those kind of stuff. So so I guess I'd summarize it and say financing. Understand all the different methods of acquiring and buying and selling properties. Yeah, that's so good, right? Because I think growing up, we're we always hear like pay your house off early, right? Like pay 40 bucks a month extra on your house and, yep. you know, uh, don't, don't get auto loans. And, you know, I definitely agree like credit cards, you need to stay away from it because Americans were just programmed to be spenders, consumers. Yep. Right. And if you do save a little bit, really, what's your bank, what's the money in the bank doing? Like nothing. So you right. really have to go from being a spender or most people do. I totally did. I, I had to go from being a spender to a saver to where I'm living on less than what I make, yep. right? And then go from a saver to an investor where like you're talking about, you learn these financial instruments that, you know, you can put, I was talking to um, an agent in my office today and he's like, hey, sh- should I do this deal? And I was like, well, let's like deconstruct it, right? Really, it came down to, he's getting a 30 year fixed rate mortgage and he is putting $10,000 down to control a $500,000 asset. Yep. Right. And I was like, if you just live in it one year, like stop thinking in monthly terms and think in 10 year terms. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think so often, and, and that's part of the reason I'm doing this podcast is because like people need to know there's another way than just, you know, sitting in a cubicle for 40 years and going to a job you hate just to pay the bills. So maybe you can have enough money to retire one day. Yeah. 
No, it's so true. I mean, if that person starting when they're 19 in a job were to just buy one average rental a year, right? Those rentals, they would be worth millions compared to the little 401k. I mean, unless you work for Facebook and you're in early and, you know, there's, there's exceptions to every rule, but I, I agree hundred percent with you and your example of that $10,000 investment, you know, fast forward 10 years, that equity appreciation, holy cow, his return on 10 grand, like it, it, it would be so high. It's not even funny. I mean, you know, you, it'd be really hard to calculate because it would be such a high percentage, you yeah. know? And, and so again, it goes back to understanding leverage and how to leverage, you know, with the right loan, with the right property, and as little money as you can put into it down. Now you want to be careful because if values drop, you know, I mean, there's there's all sorts of little kind of like the small ball of this stuff, but in general, I think a higher level is what we're talking about. I totally agree with you. Yeah. That's pretty much what I told this agent too. I I was like, look, you've got to you've got to live someplace anyways. So we calculated the difference in in the payment of what he's currently in. And I was like, we'll make that a rental. How much is it going to cash flow? And then what's your difference? And then apply the cash flow to that house. And I kind of showed him the pieces to the puzzle to where this makes a lot of sense. And I said, it, the townhouse is in Lehigh, right? Booming area in Utah. And I said, do you think this is going to be worth more or less in 10 years? Yeah. Right? He goes more. And I said, okay, well, do you think rent's going to be more or less in 10 years? And I said, okay, well, where are interest rates going to be? And, and, and really that's where he started guessing everything because I'm sure you've seen it in the last 45 days, residential interest rates are ticking up faster than I've ever seen them go before. Yep. And he was just super freaked out about the rate. And I said, look, the rate matters, but it really doesn't because it's fixed for 30 years. It's a one-way bet, right? So your bet is interest rates. If if they go up, you now look like a genius because you have a 5% rate instead of an 8% rate. Yep. Right. If rates go down, you refi down. And you save yep. money every month. But if it makes sense today, do it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. 100%. More people need to learn alternative ways, right? Cool. Last question. And then we can get into some of the other stuff. Knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently on your journey? I mean, 2020 is so easy to deconstruct, but then you never know, like if you would have taken that path, if some of the other opportunities that you came into later weren't there, but I would say in general, it would be this, you know, back when we were flipping super high volume, I was way more concerned about making enough to kind of cover that monthly nut and lifestyle that I would not have missed saying instead of flipping 60 houses a year, I flipped 50, but kept 10, you know, I would have really wish I would have kept more properties when I started at a younger age, because obviously values were so much lower than right. And the equity appreciation would far outpace whatever little savings plan I did not in real estate with that extra cash. Or what, so, you know, maybe I I hate having a budget. I mean, you need to have a budget, but I don't like it in the sense of like, I always just figure I'll just go do a couple more deals to pay for that. But I do think some sort of a budget when you're younger and not like if you're a flipper, for example, and I can only go back to my experience, not keeping more at an earlier age and holding on to them longer. I mean, I would have, so much equity and so many properties. If I would have kept those flips in Rose Park that where I was buying it 70,000 that are now worth 450, you know, I mean, my mortgage would not be there anymore. I'd be, you know, you talk about being financially free. I would, time's going to solve all your problems in real estate, a long-term time horizon, unless the population ceases to exist and the world changes as we know it. But assuming that it stays like it's basically been, there's been peaks and valleys, but long-term, everything's going to go up in value, right? And then the beauty thing about real estate is someone else is paying your obligation. You know, your tenant is in there paying down your mortgage. So if I could go back in time, I would definitely hold on to way more properties earlier. Now, back then though, is like, well, how do I qualify are these? And so I guess going hand in hand with that is finding a mentor and getting resources and educating yourself as much as possible, as quickly as possible, I think would have gotten me to a quicker or, you know, a a further level quicker 
because I kind of waited a little bit till I did more learning and networking at RIAs and stuff like that. I kind of just stayed in my box and just bought and fixed and flipped houses, bought and fixed and flipped houses. Um, so there, there's probably a few different things I would do better then, but educate yourself, get a mentor, buy and hold, and, and um, you know, don't worry too much about your lifestyle, you know, uh, until you get a, a bunch of assets under your belt and you kind of know that path that you're headed. Because then it, it kind of fixes in your head. And then, you know, you and I were talking a little bit before we started recording about what that looks like to be financially free. Ultimately, it's like the game of, um, you know, cash flow where your assets are producing at the most passive level possible enough money to basically fund your life and not just a scarcity life, an abundant life of, you know, where you want to live, the vacations you want to go on, all that kind of stuff. So, I, so I, I would have gotten to where I could be at that place a lot quicker. I think if I had gone back in time and, and held more than just selling them, but you know, everyone's in a different boat. Like, I was always an entrepreneur and didn't have a W-2 job. So I was always relying on that flip money to fund my lifestyle, right? So if you're in the other shoes and you have a really good high paying job and you love that job and you can sock away a lot of extra money, then plow that into real estate, you know? So you got to look at it and see what your specific situation is, your family situation, your risk tolerance, that kind of thing. But no one would regret holding a bunch of real estate that's cash flowing or at least breaking even with a good tenant and, and a reasonable mortgage payment, you know, over a 20, 30 year time horizon. I mean, really, Jordy, don't you think you can be kind of one of like the most unsophisticated, you know, you don't need to be smart doing real estate. Like if your time horizon is 20, 30 years, you just got to be able to qualify, know how to manage a renter and let them pay that mortgage down over time. And then you're going to be sitting on a pile of gold. 100% agree. In fact, I always say, I think real estate and specifically owning rental properties, it's like the everyday average Joe guy's way to, to being a millionaire, to, yep. to having enough money that they can comfortably retire, right? Even if you only buy four or five houses in 20 year period, yep. right? If you just don't sell, and, you know, a lot of people go, oh, well, you know, I have to put 20% down. And to your point, there's other ways of financing stuff. Overall, rents go up over time. Like if you look at how our system's rigged, it's rigged against the guy that just doesn't save, doesn't invest. He, you know, just spends everything he makes and everything gets more expensive with inflation yep. because the government is trying to pay off their debt with cheaper dollars in the future. Right. And um, we won't go down the rabbit hole of is that sustainable or not. But, you know, you're kind of doing the same thing the government's doing if you buy a bunch of houses and let somebody else pay them off. Right. And your point in your example, uh, you know, recently rates have been so awesome. So if you lock in and on investment property and Jordy, we're fortunate enough to own um, properties together at what, like, what was it, 3.9 or 3.75 or 4%. And inflation's at seven percent. Rents are going up, but your mortgage never changes. <laughs> like, how do you? You only lose if you like turn the lights off and decide not to focus on your property management and your operations of stuff, right? Otherwise, man, those tenants are gonna keep paying your mortgage down. Your payment, for the most part, won't go up at all. Rents will go up. Values will go up. I mean, it's the ultimate kind of hockey stick, and you do it in volume. And then that hockey stick and that pile of equity just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows at a quicker rate. Yeah, no, totally. And, and I think, you know, the only way you can really mess it up is, you know, you don't screen your tenants properly. Mm -hmm. So like hire a property manager, if you guys are listening to this and you're thinking of self-managing and vet them really well, because that will save you probably 95% of the headaches. You know, if you, if you throw a tenant in there and they're a drug dealer or, you know, whatever they're doing is just not conducive and then you have to evict them and you don't have the money to fix up the house, like it can definitely spiral negative. Yeah. But for the most part, you know, if you just educate yourself, like you said, you go to RIAs, which is for anyone listening that uh, doesn't know, it's a real estate investor association. You can just Google your city and RIA, R-E-I-A and find your local real estate investor association. And Matt and I are lucky enough to so serve on the board of uh, Sluria, which is Salt Lake Real Estate Investor Association. And Matt's the current sitting president. So, I mean, maybe speak a little bit to the value that we try to bring 
and and I know most RIAs are like 150 bucks a year. Yeah. Like it's comical to me that people won't do that, but then they'll go and spend $20,000 on a seminar teaching them how to get rich quick, right? Oh man, yeah, so many comments on that. But before I forget one of the things you mentioned um, about property management, and that actually goes hand in hand with, I, I kind of had, a, I've been having to change my mindset over the last six or seven years of that rugged entrepreneur where I'm just going to do everything. Part of the reason looking back why I did not buy more rentals is I thought, oh, I'm going to save money managing them myself. What I learned was I'm a crappy property manager. Like if that's all I was doing, I could probably be okay with it. But you're so worried about also making the, the money flipping or whatever your day job. And then you know, we only have so much time, right? So, so then you get a few different rentals going on and then you just are like, man, I don't want this to be hard. Fine, just go rent it. I don't want to take the time to screen you. I don't want to take the time because you're just kind of hoping this is going to be a good tenant. This is going to be a good tenant. And then sure enough, they go and destroy it because there are professional renters out there that can know how to kind of sneak under the radar. Totally. And then you're left with this bigger problem. And then it's like, whatever you would have paid for a property manager, like it's not even close to what you spent on trying to fix your problems. And then it also then hampers you where you're like, well, I don't want to own more of these if I have to manage them, but I do want to more own more of them. So, you know, there's this book that came out recently and it's, it's, they've kind of like changed the way that you talk about it, but it's, it's not like a, a new thing, but who not how get into that mode sooner than later of it's not, how are you going to do this? It's who's going to help you. And then once I finally got that mindset, it was like, well, this is great. I could, man, all I need now to do is just worry about financing these because I already know I have someone that's going to help me with all the property management, you know, and then you do still need to be involved, but holy cow, I don't worry at all about my properties anymore. I just worry about making sure that I got the right team behind me, the right who's for my house. So anyway, Ria's holy cow, 150 bucks. I can't even tell you my return on 150 bucks annually over the last six or seven years. It's it's off the chart. There's, I mean, I, I know we don't have time to go into all of this, but the knowledge that you'll get that you wouldn't get otherwise, knowledge in terms of like practical knowledge and strategies, knowledge as far as referrals of who can do what for you, plumbers, electricians, strategies, you know, what other people are doing. One, you get to meet cool people like we got to know each other at the RIAs, right? And what ends up happening? We develop a friendship and a trust and confidence. We do deals together, right? I guarantee you, I would not have been comfortable or met you had we not been at the RIAs. In, it maybe wasn't immediate, but it's like, oh, who's that guy? Oh, Jordy, okay, what's up? You know, once a month you see each other and it's like, well, let's go to lunch. Let's find a deal. Like I wouldn't have known you without the RIAs. So knowledge, networking, and then once you do that, you got to take action. I mean, you know about my deal. I mean, I've, I've done so many hard money deals from the RIAs and one pivot comment. I also think you got to go from the standpoint of what can I give? How can I add value instead of being a taker? You know, like life gives to the giver. So go to the RIAs with an open mind, be willing to share, be willing to collaborate. Um, I really don't think there's any secrets out there in real estate. I mean, they're in books, they're in there. So if you think you're doing something extra cool and awesome, you're not, you know, someone else is doing it and someone else is probably doing it a little bit better. So why not go and share and learn together? But then once you do that and then you take action, I mean, at one of the RIAs two, year, two years ago, someone presented a deal in the front of the room that fast forward to today ended up being a deal that I bought then bought the land next door, developed into 10 townhomes, just sold all of those and ended up with about $1.4 million in, in net profit on this deal. I would not have found that deal had I not been in the room at the RIA. So there's deals to be made, there's networking to be made, there's education to be made. And you're right, it's the cheapest barrier to entry possible. But what it does require is time, involvement, participation, which for a lot of people is hard to do because we all want kind of that quick fix. Well, I don't know. Give me that. Give me the that magic pill. on Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah I, no, I don't know. I just rather follow someone Bitcoin. Oh, like, and not that that's a bad idea, but real estate, unless you have a pile of money to begin with, you do real estate's all about your network, networking, you know, and, and some people are better at it. And some people, you know, aren't, some people are shy, but you know, I I'm with you at some point you do hit your bandwidth limit of like, I can't go to these meetings every day. So you do maybe have to pick and choose when you go, but don't just go and go. At some point, you got to do and take some sort of action. I think that's great. And, and just going back to your comment earlier, 
you know, if someone is listening to this podcast and they feel like, well, how am I going to give it a RIA? I know nothing about real estate, right? Well, a lot of the times to put a deal together, you need three things. You need someone's credit, you need capital, and you need time, you know, and if you take the credit out, then you need a deal. So a lot of the times uh, what we see is there's a lot of new investors that, you know, they get the itch, they get the bug, they want to start finding deals, but you know, they don't have any cash. They want to buy rentals. They want to get the financial freedom yet. They have a ton of time, right? Maybe, yeah. maybe they work a job where, you know, they're a nurse or something and they can work three days a week. And then they've got four days a week off and they can go out and find deals where, you know, guys who maybe are more developed don't have a lot of time because, you know, you've got a ton going, I've got a ton going every successful full-time real estate investor has a ton going at any given time. And so time is one thing we don't have, right? But we have the knowledge and know-how. And so going back to your comment of the mentor, that can be the best place to find a mentor is at one of your local real estate investor associations. You can take a deal to someone and that's adding value. That's giving, yep. right? Um, and it, it's kind of like, I use the analogy of money, right? If you, if you hold your hand out uh, flat faced with a palm up, money can land in your hand. And then if that money lands in your hand and the wind blows it away, well, if it's open, more money can fall in it, right? But if it's closed and you hold on to the three bucks you have, well, no money's getting in, in your hand, right? Yeah. And just going to your comment of the giving, that, that's how this all works, right? I've, I've borrowed millions of dollars from you as a hard money lender on my fix and flips you know, even on properties that we've bought and then refinanced uh, the Burr method that you were talking about. And we'll go more into that in a different episode. But there's a lot that you can give, even if you think you have no knowledge. So, I mean, if you're listening to this, definitely find your local uh, RIA. If you're in Salt Lake or Utah counties, reach out to Matt and I, and we're happy to connect you with whichever one fits your schedule or geography the best and just continue to show up and learn and then take action, right? Because you can know how to do everything, but if you never take action, you're never going to get to financial freedom. Oh yeah. You know, you see it all the time, Jordy. And, and another quick comment. When I say life gives the giver, that doesn't mean you give everything away for free, right? Like, I mean, you can still provide a service and charge people for it. And it's not like you're giving away for free, but it is coming more from a standpoint of how can I really help? And hopefully we all have a service and a product that is actually valuable and beneficial. Like with the hard money loans, I, I love the little ecosystem because, you know, and I borrow myself all the time, but like in your example, you said you have a house, maybe you don't have all the cash that you need to do it. Yes. You get a hard money loan. It's more expensive than cash, but without that cash or that loan, you wouldn't be able to do a project that could still put say 40 or 50,000 bucks in your pocket, right? And yes, it is putting dollars in my pocket and it's also putting dollars in my investor's pocket, but then it's also giving you a profit and then someone that buys the house from you, a remodeled house that maybe they wouldn't have the resources to do. So it is kind of a cool, like I like seeing value created. That's why I love real estate is you can see directly the value that's created. Some other businesses, it's hard for me to see the value that's always created. And so creating that value is, is really, really important. And then I, I kind of went on a, a tangent there, but the follow-up question you were talking about then was, give me back in line here. Give me back in line here. My thought train has just been listening to everything you're saying, and there's just so much value in that ecosystem. Yep. Because I think a lot of the times, you know, people get hung up on, uh, you know, oh, it's 12% interest. Yeah. Like, oh, that's, that's way too high. Right. Even going back to, you know, the 5% interest that this agent was going to get on his loan. And, you know, a lot of times we need to stop thinking like, oh, well, what's, what's that person over there making? Yep. Right. And we need to look at the deal uh, and go, well, what am I going to make off of it? Right. Yep. And, and I mean, there's a lot of times, like, I think I paid, Last year, I paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest on hard money loans, but I made a multiple of that based on my flips because, you know, we, we go in, we buy something that's distressed, you fix it up and you resell it. And after you've paid everything, recouped your initial uh, investment, then you're getting a return. And a lot of the times I, I see returns of 40, 50, 60, 80, 200% even. Yeah, yeah 
on my money. And so if, if I'm making even a 50% return on my money and you're making 12% and you're splitting that with, you know, another investor because you're the broker, well, do I really care what you're making if, if I'm making 50% return on my investment, right? right. But, but so often I think new investors, they get caught up in those little nuances that really like it's an ecosystem. Your end investor who's funding the deal, they're probably living on those funds as retirement. Oh, right? 100%. I know or, my, a lot of my guys are. Yeah. And so they're like, hey, if I can collect this, like this will sustain me. It will keep me in financial freedom, right? Uh, Matt Atkinson always talks about, and I'll, I'll do another episode just about these three, but there's three different types of investors. There's a starter, there's a builder, and then there's an ender, right? Starters are just getting started. Years one through 10, uh, builders, that's kind of where you and I are at. Mm -hmm. We're years 10 through 30. And then enders, they're 30 plus, right? So they've been investing for 30 years. They have capital and they just want preservation of their capital and to pay the least amount of taxes possible. Yeah. Well, guess what? Interest income is the lowest taxed income in the tax code, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not a CPA, but that, that's the most efficient way to earn a retirement. So just going back to your comment of ecosystem, it, it all works together and it, it's a small world show up authentically, give where you can give, learn where you can learn and take action. Yeah. And, and also the other comment to piggyback off of this as you kind of wrap up, but that abundant mindset too. Like I always give the analogy, sometimes we get so beat up as like, man, I missed that one. But no, there's another one coming. You know, the, the, the next bus, this bus is still looping, right? Like, you know, the Greyhounds are leaving the station every day. And so it's really then up to us as active as we want to be to go find that next opportunity. And even inside that opportunity, there's so many cool ways to manipulate it. Like not to go off on a tangent, but like that property we bought together, that fiveplex one, it solved a problem for the seller. They needed to sell it because they had some other responsibilities in life that they were working on. So they needed a fair deal, but they also needed a relatively quick deal. Right. So we were able to structure it where he gave them a little cash, did a seller finance at a little higher rate, but we didn't have to deal with the pain of getting a commercial loan. Then the situation changed a little bit. We improved the quality of the building. We raised rents. And then the seller had another situation where it would have benefited them to get paid off in full and to pay their underlying loan off. So it was a great opportunity to us to then qualify for the loan with a little bit more time, get a lower rate reduce our obligation on the debt while at the same time increasing the rents on the property. And at the end of the day, I'll started with probably that seller was like, man, this is a really good deal for us. We were thinking like, yeah, this is a deal that works great for us. We didn't need to get it for free because that's just not how the world works. Right. And they didn't need to sell it for way more than it was worth. We struck a deal that made sense and then we were able to manipulate it along the way. So it even became a better deal for us. And it just turned out that it actually turned to be a better deal for the seller as well, because they got that loan off their tail. I mean, there's a lot of details there, but the point being is you can also take an existing deal that was a fair deal and make it even better. You don't have to like overly win on every single deal, right? Like kind of what you were saying. It's like, yeah, you pay interest. That sucks. But like on your flips, if you would have had to raise and wait to, to have a couple million dollars to be able to do four flips at a time. You just, man, you wouldn't be flipping until you were 80 years old, yeah. right? And you would have passed by so many opportunities. But by even if you were to finance 100% with hard money, man, you're still making whatever. Yeah, maybe you don't make 60, but you make 40 or 50. You're still making way more money than you would have without the resources available to you. Yeah, yeah. And, and way more than I would have sitting at a bank of a desk. Or yes. The desk of a bank like I used to, right? So just, uh, just to put a nice little bow on it here, uh, you mentioned seller financing. Before we wrap up, can you explain a little bit uh, what seller financing is and how somebody who's maybe new or they've got a couple of properties, how can they use that to their advantage in this market? Um, because it is very competitive and there's a lot of sellers who don't want to seller finance. I mean, we were able to do one last year, right? Yeah. So maybe explain a little bit what uh, your interpretation of seller financing is. We don't need to get into the weeds, but yeah. yeah. 
there, there's so many different ways, but in, in general, okay, Jordy, let's just use the example between you and I, let's, let's say I'm trying to buy your house. I have, okay. I have basically three options, I guess. I mean, I probably have more options if we get really creative, but I could have enough cash to wire you the money and buy it from you. I could go out and get a loan. Let's just make up a bank from Wells Fargo and they will give me a loan. That loan will then convert to cash into your account and you get paid. Or if you're open to it and it's a win-win for both of us, I could come to you and say, hey, Jordy, uh, I want to buy this house from $500,000 from you. I don't want to get a loan or maybe I don't want to, but instead of getting a loan or instead of paying cash, what if you just be the bank? And you take your property and you basically sell or finance it to me, meaning you will do an installment loan with me. And there's more to it on the back end because you may have an underlying mortgage or maybe you own it free and clear. If you own it free and clear, it's a true seller finance where you're like, you know what? I don't actually need all this money today, nor do I want it. I just don't want to own the property anymore. So great. Yes, I'll be the bank for you. Instead of paying me $500,000, what you're going to do is pay me $2,500 a month for the next 30 years. So essentially that seller finances, the seller is becoming the bank or the source of capital for that person. And it's usually paid back in an installment loan, maybe over 30 years, maybe 20, whatever you and the seller agree to. So like you said, there's, man, there's like a whole seminar, multiple books you could do on this, but essentially seller financing is getting financing from the seller rather than a bank or your own funds. And it's an awesome way to do it if one, say you have crappy credit, you can't get a bank loan. Two, you maybe don't have the down payment requirement that a regular bank would want. Or, and it's essential, it's really good if the seller has a really low interest rate on their current mortgage and can charge you a little higher rate and it's still a win-win for both of you, they can even make more money than they would have made if they would have just sold you for cash. So there's so many pluses and minuses, more pluses, I think, if both people are in agreement on how to make it work. Um, and I think if the more you can learn about seller financing, which I want to learn more about it, the more properties you can responsibly buy um, because they don't count on your credit, you know. And so I have bought, you know, one with you and then I have a few other seller finance, but I've also done seller finance for people who have bought from me. So it's a great way you can do it back and forth. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, well, let's wrap up. Thank you so much for your time. If people want to know more about you, where can they find out everything that you do? Yeah, I'll, I'll have you include in the short show notes. So I have some free resources like a fix and flip calculator, a Burr calculator. I, I, you know, Jordy will provide all my social media links. Um, but really email and text and phone are great. You can hit me up. And then uh, we can look at a deal or go through something, strategize, whatever. Um, I, I, you know, I've only benefited in my life from other people taking the time to teach me something or to listen to me. So I always, it, you know, with the time I have and the bandwidth, I always want to be available because, you know, I, like quick example, I had a borrower contact me and I'm like, well, great. They're new. They don't know anything about this. So we took the time to talk about it. And then I'm like, well, what do you do for work? Oh, he works at a bank that does warehouse lines for guys like me. I'm like, well, wait, okay. So this is good. Let's keep talking. So I always learn something new from the people I'm talking to. And hopefully we can, you know, learn together. And so hit me up, text, email, and Jordy will give you all my contact info. Okay, perfect. And then if people want to attend Slaria, um, I'll link to, uh, in the show notes to, to Slurria's website. We meet once a month. We have a couple of luncheons in different parts of Salt Lake Valley. Um, but Matt, thank you so much for bringing so much value. I appreciate it. And guys, if you enjoyed this content, please share it on social media, share it with someone who could benefit from this. Cause Matt and I, we just want to help you guys get closer and closer to financial freedom. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Financially Free Investor. If you found value in this episode or know someone who would find value in this information, please share with them, subscribe, and send us a review.